If Fuller tells us, if three men go along a road, they become two men, for the greater number kills the lesser. And Neferohu, I show thee the brother is an enemy, and the man who kills his own father. Every mouth is full of love me, and everything good has disappeared. Sounds very modern. Order had vanished in anarchy and in universal banditry, and no man knew when he would be struck down from ambush or murdered in his own house. Yes, his own house. For the Lamentations incidentally show us that during the centuries preceding the collapse, the perfect socialist state under its incarnate God had not been able to maintain its pure form. It had somehow progressed from socialism toward a higher form of social organization in which there was private property, not only in practice, as of course has to be in, in any society, but probably also in theory. The writers take it for granted. Neferohu complains that men take a man's property away from him, and it is given to him who is from outside. I show thee the owner in need and the outsider satisfied. The phrase, by the way, that is, that is translated, him who is from outside, uh, just means that. Uh, it's hard to, you couldn't re put a more specific modern meaning to it without running the risk of falsifying the text. I suppose it means the uh, stranger, uh, the person who was not an owner of the property, possibly a person who was not a participant in the civilization. If Pilar goes on to say, the robber is now the possessor of riches. The children of great men are dashed against the walls. Great ladies now glean in the fields. The owners of fine robes are clad in rags. But he who never wove for himself is now the owner of fine linen. End quote. It's clear that Egypt had risen, though perhaps precariously, to a level far above pure socialism, and that must have made the collapse the more terrible. Now, of course, Egypt eventually recovered from the chaos that historians euphemistically call the first intermediate period. And she went on to complete with many vicissitudes her 3,000 years as a great and independent nation, a record that only China can rival. But men who witnessed the collapse could not foresee that. The apparent end of human civilization, overthrown by a barbarism made more savage and terrible, because it had captured the weapons and resources that civilization had produced, must have been a traumatic shock unsurpassed thus far in the experience of mankind. Contemporaries felt utter despair. Neferohu concluded, the land is completely perished so that no remainder exists. And Ipulwer could only regard mankind as a failure and wish that it would disappear. He says, Ah, oh, would that it were the end of men, that there were no conception and no birth. Then would the earth cease from turmoil and be at rest. Did not occur, by the way, to either Neferohu or Akuwer, nor so far as we know did it occur to any later Egyptian, to ask why the catastrophe had befallen them. That, by the way, is an interesting datum to be taken into consideration. Neferohu was, of course, quite right when he said, what has never happened has happened. You could not have expected him to have constructed a historical parallel. There was none available. But it seems that at no time in their long existence as a nation did the Egyptians think in terms of historical causes and effect. They compiled chronologies, but they never wrote history. And it could be argued that history and the sense of the reasoned reporting of political and social change was the product of the Greek mind and perhaps confined only to our own civilization, which has inherited the Greek tradition, and to such peoples as the Greeks influenced, as, for example, in the Muslim, so-called Muslim uh, Enlightenment. But that would be a long argument. 
The most perfect socialist state known to history, however, was not Egypt. It was located in what is now modern Peru, Ecuador, little of northern Chile, and of western Bolivia. It was the state that was ruled by the Incas, and sometimes we improperly refer to the people as Incas. Inca, of course, is, the, is a term which means essentially the same thing as Pharaoh. I cannot go into this culture, but I do suggest to you an extremely enlightening book by Louis Baudin. It's L'Empire Socialiste des Incas, published by the Institut d'Ethnologie in Paris in 1928. A good deal of information concerning the Incas can be had from a book that now appears in a paperback on most of the newsstands by Victor von Hagen called The Realm of the Incas. This, was a, this, as I say, was the perfect socialist state. It was of rather recent origin. The first Inca, Manco Capac, ruled approximately 1100 A.D., perhaps a little earlier. And, of course, the nation lasted in isolation with no foreign enemies other than barbarian tribes on its border until 1532, when Francisco Pizarro and a 130-foot soldiers took over an empire of many millions of people. Here again, you get into historical questions that are ardently debated. Was the Inca culture indigenous, or was it imported from abroad? There is a good deal of evidence that it may have been imported. For one thing, who carried cotton to the land of the Incas? It must have been done by men. Cotton is not an indigenous plant to the Western Hemisphere. It has a culture that in many ways resembled that of the first dynasties of Egypt. Very high degree of skill in architecture, in ceramics, in agriculture, and in animal husbandry. As you all know, that useful beast, the llama, has to be artificially bred, it will not reproduce itself. On the other hand, they had no literature or higher culture or history because they had no writing. They had barely oral traditions. However, they did have a highly elaborate system of bookkeeping by means of the kipu, the knotted threads which make possible the compilation of statistics. And since the threads have color, they can be coded, much in the way that telephone, as telephone wires are uh, coded in a uh, conduct now, and uh, consequently the statistics of the whole empire were pre uh, preserved in literally miles of knotted thread. There were many other points of, there were certain points of resemblance to Egypt that seem somewhat remarkable. The Incas, of course, like the pharaohs, always married their own sisters. In Peru, that privilege was not extended to the rest of the population as it was in Egypt. They were always embalmed. The Incas were regarded as the sons of the sun. Again, as in Egypt, the pharaoh was the son of Ra, the son of the sun, therefore the son of God. And, of course, when he died, he returned to his home in heaven, and was succeeded by his divine offspring. Of course, there are also differences between the Inca culture and the Egyptian, and I'm not suggesting that it was an Egyptian colony, although one is tempted often to think in those terms. But the Inca society, as I say, perfect socialism. Everybody was supervised from the womb to the tomb. You had a very elaborate bureaucracy. For each 10,000 inhabitants, there were 1,121 supervisors. And that's even better than the New Deal has succeeded in doing thus far. The great bureaucracy was composed largely of descendants of the Inca. The Inca, given the fact that he, unlike his subjects, enjoyed polygamy, 
um, was in a better position than, let us say, the Kennedy clan is to staff the bureaucracy. It was not unusual for a living Inca to have 500 living descendants in the male line. So he could make a considerable contribution to uh, the progress of his country, you see. As in Egypt, he was the owner. He owned everything. And he took care of everybody. Nobody had any worries. Didn't even have to worry about what to do with his leisure time because that was organized, taken care of for him. All he had to do was do what he was told to do. He was owned by the Inca, as everything else was. And the Inca, well, it was a privilege to belong to him. He was the son of the sun. He was divine. And as a matter of fact, socialism seems to have worked very, very well in Peru. History knows no evidence of discontent. No people in the world seems ever to have been more satisfied with its form of government. This state of general euphoria may have been heightened by two advantages that the Incas enjoyed uh, in the governing of their subjects. The first was that the um, race had endemic syphilis. As you know, there are great differences in racial reaction to that disease. It is a disease that, if unchecked, becomes fatal to white men. Um, to the Indian population of Peru, it was something like chronic sinus trouble and produced mere stolidity. doesn't seem to have impaired fecundity at all. And so maybe that would contribute to a pleasant and happy socialist society of the United States if we were to have one. And I pass the suggestion on to the Bureau of Health, Education, and Welfare. <laughs> the other uh, thing that contributed to the stability of the Inca regime, perhaps, was the availability of coca, the leaves that are the principal source of cocaine. Uh, the Spanish, uh, the first Spaniards differ considerably in their account as to how widely these leaves were used. I cannot say that the whole population went around happily chewing cocaine all the time. Um, that is a possibility. Um, some Spaniards rec uh, report that cocaine was reserved for the um, upper classes. Um, sort of reminds one of uh, the New Deal and Harry Hopkins. However, 